Thanks. So I'm not claiming that this is M82, but uh, it's a dwarf galaxy undergoing a starburst. As um, John and Dan and I have been discussing, it's more of a transient for this guy, <laughs> um, rather, than, uh, rather than sort of maybe an ongoing starburst analog of a ULURG or something. So um, I've been working on galaxy formation more or less since my thesis. I've, I have a big interest in hydrodynamics and astrophysics, and this is a nice way to bring those two things together. And one of the difficult questions that's always plagued this field is that you can do gravity from first principles with n body. You can do hydro from first principles to some degree, but the star formation and the feedback, the energy input that really dramatically shapes the process, you can't really resolve, and so it gets complicated. And so these energy inputs do a lot of important things, and they're non-trivial. So they're drivers for the turbulence. The ISM is ubiquitously turbulent. It's supersonically turbulent. So the uh, energy budget is a lot of its kinetic. Um, it drives outflows, which are very important for uh, mediating the growth of galaxies and their contents, and also ISM structure in terms of cold phases, hot phases, and all the interesting things that drive people who observe star-forming regions. Um, we have a lot of sources available, um, galactic accretion, um, shear or MRI, things related to the rotation, rotational nature of the galaxy, and thermal instability. Um, those are kind of one class of drivers. Another one is stellar sources, which could be jets, winds, radiation, um, which could be infrared radiation pressure, FUV onto dust grains, EUV, which is sort of classical H2 regions, um, and supernovae. So there's a huge stellar component. And also we have X-rays, um, cosmic UV, uh, cosmic rays, and uh, in principle jets and radiation from AGN. Now, the, the first class here, in principle, you can simulate directly. We can do the hydro, supposedly. So we can actually get these things to happen spontaneously. Um, and AGN are usually reserved as being important for very large halos, things that will become ellipticals or CDs or so on. So given that most people feel that galaxy formation is not a solved question, even for small galaxies, we can stay there and avoid that as an issue. And so I'm going to focus on the middle uh, area, what's coming from stars, because this is strongly coupled to the star formation process itself. And... Um, uh, something that we really need to include if we want to regulate our star formation. I will point out that X-rays, UV, and cosmic rays may be important. People write papers every now and then arguing they are, but they're very hard to do uh, numerically for various reasons. And so, for the most part, they're, they're being ignored um, by the community. So in terms of the budget we have to work with, if we're looking at stars, the place that everyone goes is Starburst 99, Lithra et al. 99, and follow-ons. And so per solar mass, you have roughly this much energy. So this is assuming a pretty standard saltpeter IMF at the high mass end, which is all that really matters for feedback. And uh, our sources are as follows. We have type 2 supernovae, which is a pretty robust source of energy, um, regardless of you know, complicating factors like metallicity. We have stellar winds, which is quite variable depending on metallicity. This is for solar type metallicity. Um, and we have these honking big sources, which is the bolometric luminosity and ultraviolet, which are largely ignored um, for a couple of reasons. Now, all of these have different physical regimes where they become effective. So winds really only last in the for the first four mega years or so when you have massive stars to drive them. Then you start to get into the supernova regime in the next four to 40 mega years, depending on your IMF and what your assumptions are about which stars go supernovae. Radiation pressure is something that needs very high optical depths in the infrared to be effective. Otherwise, it's a pretty small input. Um, and I would actually differentiate between these based on a scale. So what I would argue is that these feedbacks are large-scale feedbacks in the sense that they create velocities that are interesting on a galactic scale. Right? If you want to do something that's interesting on a galactic scale, 10 kilometers per second doesn't really cut it. That is essentially ISM turbulence. It doesn't push any material out of a galaxy. Um, and so while it can maintain the structure of a galaxy and uh, structure within the ISM, um, it's not really going to push things around and change the budget in terms of the fuel you have to form stars within the galaxy. 
So I'm going to, um, to make that cut, and I'm going to put everything else in the small scale uh, bucket. So people have argued that radiation pressure could be effective, um, but there is a huge debate about whether tau IR really can get large enough to drive that and make it push it into the regime where it becomes a useful feedback or whether it kind of is self-quenching because as soon as it starts to get going, it, the covering factor becomes low and it just leaks. So another way of looking at this in terms of large and small is you can think of uh, any speed in terms of an associated sound speed and temperature. So interesting speeds in a galaxy are of order 100 kilometers per second. That's an interesting speed. You can kick things out of a dwarf galaxy with that. And if you convert that to a temperature, you're talking a million Kelvin or so. Right? So that's another way of characterizing hot versus cold. Right? So if you're above a million Kelvin, then you actually get into this part of the cooling curve where the cooling times become long. So you might then hope that that feedback can be effective because that energy can hang around. Right? Whereas once you're in this regime between about 10 to the 5 and 10 to the 6 Kelvin, the cooling is incredibly strong. So any energy you dump there, if it's thermalized, it's going to disappear very quickly. So this creates a bit of a buffer between the small and the large scale uh, feedbacks. On the other hand, once you're below about 10 to the 4K, which is not in uh, Rob Wiersman's plot here, since the old Dalgano McRae area, then you get another drop in cooling and you get another regime where this energy can hang around pretty well. Um, and, uh, uh, be, be fairly effective. So this is partly also what leads to a natural division between sort of small and large when you think about uh, feedback. So um, the large scale feedback has slightly different roles. It's regulating the baryon budget of galaxies. Because you can actually boot material out of a galaxy, if you can get into the 100 kilometers per second regime, you can actually change the available fuel and change the total stellar content it's possible to make with that galaxy with these kind of feedbacks. So it's now been recognized in the last two or three years that this kind of feedback is probably essential if you want to match the stellar mass, halo mass relations that people are now trying to extract from very large surveys like Sloan. Right? Now we have very large, um, highly resolved studies producing halo uh, mass functions, you know, millennium and things like that, and you can match that to very large detailed observational studies which are giving you um, stellar content you kind of just rank them and say the biggest halos have the biggest stellar content and then that's abundance matching. And when you do that, you actually for the first time um, get a pretty good handle on the expectation in terms of stellar mass for a given halo mass. Up until about five years ago, it was pretty much open slather. You can make as many stars as you want and then wave your hands and argue it looks like a galaxy, must be a galaxy. So this has kind of changed the rules of this field a little bit and forced people to actually argue that the number of stars they get is, is in the right ballpark. The roles for the small scale or the kinetic type feedback are different. They hold up the ASM. They internally regulate star formation and the structure of the ASM. And uh, Eve Ostreicher has had an interesting few papers arguing that this is an amazingly well-regulated process that's fairly insensitive to the details of your ISM. Uh, her argument is, is a very elegant one, in my opinion, and the argument essentially goes that you need enough um, turbulent velocity dispersion to hold up your ISM. So it's essentially a weight balance argument, and you will get enough star formation to achieve that, and then it will stop. And she's got some pretty interesting results matching things galaxies doing that. So this is a very small scale process, but it's not regulating um, star formation in the sense of the long time scales. On the long time scales, you're still essentially going to convert all that stuff into stars. And so um, even if you have well-regulated star formation on the small scale, if you don't get rid of the fuel, eventually you convert a lot of it to stars and you end up with too many. Um, and also related to that, we can't really resolve the ISM. If we're doing galaxy formation, uh, resolution elements typically weigh in sort of 100,000 solar masses for a good one, which is ridiculous, right? That's an entire molecular cloud, and so we really can't do that physics very well. And so uh, it's useful to us if we can make these kinds of arguments that regulation is effective. In terms of the history of hot feedback, um, the, the person who really got it going was Neil Katz. And uh, he put in supernova thermal energy with ridiculously low resolution, got it right smack bang in the middle of the strong cooling curve, and it all went away. And so people realized you couldn't just be naive about it. Uh, Thacker and Couchman and others, Summer Larson, Stinson, 
argue that turning off cooling temporarily was a way, it was kind of a crutch to deal with the fact that you were dumping your supernova into too much mass and so its temperature was too low. Navarro and White argued that, well, you just make it kinetic energy, then cooling's not a problem. And Dury and Della Vecchio pointed out that if it's supersonic, it just shocks and thermalizes immediately. And so it's not really a solution, right? You can't, uh, you can't get around it that way. Springer and Hernquist said, well, you can just decouple it, then you don't have any thermalization problem. It just flows out without hitting anything. Um, and this is like a, you know, go to the end game. You know, let's, let's go to the end of hydro by not doing hydro. Um, so more people working with Simon White, Marion White, Skinner Pierco, they tried to decouple the hot and cold phases in a, in a slightly different way. Um, so they did hydro, but only with each other, for example. Hot, hot pushes hot, but not cold. Cold pushes cold, but not hot. Um, so there's lots of tricks people have tried. The one I liked the most at the end of all this, Della Vecchia and Shea um, said that you don't need to play these games. If you can actually make hot gas with the right temperature, you can drive galactic winds without cheating. Right? It's all very well to say this in 2012, the resolution was dismal back here, so they couldn't even have done this if they wanted to. But now we can achieve sufficient resolution to generate hot gas with feedback at millions of Kelvin, in which case it's in the long cooling time part of the cooling curve and can hang around, push things around, and uh, they argued it drives galactic winds. But it was a bit ad hoc, right? They just said, well, we know the mass has to be low to get to the temperature we need, and they, they picked that as an input parameter. So we would like to know where you get that mass from. And this is where our superbubble idea comes in. So superbubble feedback is motivated by several things. One of them is that um, star formation tends to occur in clusters, right? So you shouldn't really think about individual supernova. You should think about of order 100, 300 supernova occurring in a relatively small volume of space over a relatively small uh, time period of order um, a few tens of mega years, right? So in that case, they will combine and generate a, uh, a, a bubble that is the product of not just those 100 supernovae, but also the stellar winds um, from those massive stars, which you saw from the starburst plot is actually at a similar level, and also possibly some contributions from UV and other things. So they're all building essentially the same bubble, right? And if you do this, the nice thing from a simulator's perspective is that you have a nice, well-resolved bubble of hot gas. So all these resolution issues and the gas being distributed, the heat being distributed in too much mass can be dealt with if you put all your hot stuff in one place. Right? So that was, that, those were drivers for us in wanting to use a super bubble. Do we know the temperature of that super bubble? That one there? No, I have no idea. Um, they're, they're in the millions. They, produce lots of x-rays and so on. I don't know this one specifically. Yeah. So the physics of super bubbles has actually been done um, in detail, semi-analytically, as you might imagine. So Weaver, Carsten, McRae, et cetera, these people got in there and they calculated everything and showed what it should do. So the papers that I like to refer to are McClough and McRae. This is uh, Mordecai McClough's thesis work. Um, and uh, Weaver et al, 1977. And so the basic picture is this you have a star cluster which is generating energy of multiple kinds and then that actually is supersonic relative to the medium around it, right? So the um, effective speeds here could be in the many thousands of kilometers per second. So they'll crash into the medium around it and thermalize. So whatever form that feedback takes doesn't really matter. It will thermalize and effectively become a hot bubble before it does anything to the surrounding medium. Um, so, and at that point, it will flow out and push on the dense medium around it. And unlike the typical supernova type models, we talk about Seedorf, Taylor, and so on, um, for a super bubble, very rapidly, you enter the thin shell phase. So rather than driving adiabatically expanding bubble, you have a lot of mass accumulating in the shell, and you're actually driving the shell as a snowplow for most of the uh, time of the bubble. So that's the situation we, we're in. And so that means you can treat it I mean, as they did semi-analytically, analytically, um, as a, a steady state input of mechanical luminosity. So it's about 10 to the 34 ergs per second per solar mass. Um, so that's about 100 uh, solar masses per supernovae or so. And in practice, 
Yes, there are some intermittent effects. There's some work by Krauss et al. looking at this. Eve Ostroker, Kim and Ostroker have a, a new preprint out looking at this. So there are some caveats, right? Intermittency could play some role here. So in terms of the features of a super bubble, it's really nice because it conserves energy an awful lot better than individual supernovae. So individual supernovae, they go through their adiabatic phase, they enter a cooling phase, and they shed a lot of their energy um, over that time. So if you look at the kind of momentum you get out of an individual supernova, it's quite low by the end. However, if you have a hot bubble in the interior that can keep itself hot enough and low enough density to keep driving the shell, then you can drive the shell and conserve a huge fraction of your energy over time. So in the analytical solution, for example, you're only losing 35% of LT, where L is your mechanical luminosity and T is your time, and you're keeping a huge amount. So almost 50% is in your hot bubble, and around 20% is in the kinetic energy of the shell. So most of these losses here are actually radiative losses in the shell. So the shell sweeps stuff up, and then that stuff is cooled down to a few thousand Kelvin, and then that shell just progresses outwards and maintains its momentum. Momentum doesn't quite scale linearly. It's about L to the 0.8, T to the 1.4. Um, so there are a lot of people periodically uh, get excited and produce papers showing that individual supernovae don't work. I think we've known this for a long time. Individual supernovae don't work very well, especially if you dump them in hot gas, whereas bubbles do, right? So I don't know why people keep putting out yet another paper saying individual supernovae don't work. It's fine, they don't work. You have to do many of them. So I think where it gets interesting is how well we approach the continuous input model through individual supernovae, whether that, this is a reasonable um, approximation. So um, the, the real limiter on this thing is cooling interior to the um, hot bubble. And that cooling is dependent on two factors. One is the temperature of the hot bubble, and the other one is its density. And the density is a little bit complicated. It's complicated because at these kind of temperatures, you have a dense shell at a few thousand K, um, and right next to it, stuff at maybe 10 to the 6, even up to 10 million Kelvin. In these conditions, thermal conduction is actually quite important, right? But what that does, instead of actually um, taking energy out of the bubble and putting it into the shell, the net effect is a mass flow. Energy is flowing into the shell material, but the, the material that you're warming up is actually flowing into the interior of the bubble. So you don't lose energy from the bubble in net, you gain mass. That's the net effect of the thermal conduction, right? Now, the trouble um, with this is it's a very, very difficult to resolve process, right? And so we needed to um, look at this quite closely to do it. And so I did this with my PhD student, Ben Keller, um, and we just published a paper on it this year. So the added physics we need is conduction, um, because without conduction, the bubble mass is the ejector mass, which is tiny, right, and useless and incorrect, right? And there's no way you get interesting outflows from galaxy, galaxies if all you're throwing out is a, an order a tenth of your supernovae um, stellar mass, right? And so we needed, we needed that. The evaporation resulting from that conduction is difficult to resolve, so we needed a treatment for that. And at early stages, the mass in the bubble can be below your resolution element mass. And so if you allow that bubble to mix in with everything else, the average temperature gets low and it will all cool. So you need some subgrid treatment to deal with the early stages. So those are the things we, we had to do. The simulation code we're using is gasoline. It's a modern SBH code. Um, I don't know why that's stalled. There we go. So um, for comparison, this is a non-modern SBH code. This is Gadget 2, and you can see the flying jellyfish. Right, it all kind of curls around, and whereas uh, this is what grid codes do and what a modern SBH code does, it all breaks up. And the difference really is getting the turbulent mixing and kelvin helmholtz instabilities correct. So this is something that in the field has, um, it's been a big change in the last five to 10 years. People have actually realized that SBH had some issues, and um, Volker moved on to a repo, and those of us with SBH codes fixed our SBH codes. Um, and the details are present in some of those papers, and also there's some recent work by Phil Hopkins and others. So if you go down the list of the things that the Volker and company said a repo's great at, right. and Gadget is not, uh, which involved anomalous entropy production and things like that, um, are you saying 
saying that these codes solve that completely? Um, I would say that they solve it, but probably don't give you the same bang for your buck that a repo does, because a repo is built on a Riemann solver, right? So your shocks are better resolved, etc. So to achieve similar results with it, with a an SBH code, you typically need higher resolution. But more particles. More particles. But right. Why can't one just do that? You can just do that. Yeah, so I would say there's no qualitative difference anymore, but there is uh, issues in terms of what's the most efficient the approach to choose. It's not. So if you use the same amount of computer time, that means that in SBH you can well, this is one reason why we continue to use SPH. Repo is not available and it's slow. So, yeah, we feel that we're, we're doing okay in that sense. Um, so, so one thing that was never implemented, or maybe it is now, is uh, if you remember a long time ago, we wanted to uh, do a, a MHD and we wanted to monitor when things would break down. So, you know, you could presumably have a monitor of the you know, simulations to say this region's in trouble because I am calculating this thing and it's clearly not right. You, you could do that. that. No one's doing that, but you could do that. People have argued we should all be doing that, yeah. but no one is. <laughs> People just blaze ahead with the most particles. That, that defines computational astrophysics. <laughs> well, computational I don't know about that. So the physics we had to put in, the first one was thermal conductivity. So this is the classic Spitzer type expression where the conductivity is essentially uh, its electrons, just uh, electrons essentially traveling with a certain mean free path and conducting heat that way. Um, one thing to keep in mind, normally conductivity is a little brutal because you have a time step that goes as delta x squared for a diffusion equation. Fortunately for us, we have a, a natural limit that the characteristic speed can't be faster than the speed of the actual electrons. It's still a little brutal because the current time is about a 17th the normal current time, but it doesn't, it means you don't get a sort of runaway to arbitrary small time steps due to the delta x squared dependence that diffusion equations have. It's driving this uh, evaporative mass flux, so I wanted to see this happen, so I did a very high resolution simulation where I only had conductivity, nothing else. This is showing Blue is particles that used to be in the dense phase here, where the dashed line is, and red is ones that started off in the less dense phase. The temperature was 10 to the 4 up to 10 to the 6 initially. So over time, conductivity is taking heat from the hot phase, giving it to the colder phase. But in a Lagrangian sense, the cold phase is flowing into the hot bubble. Right? So the, all the energy stays in the hot bubble, and what you're gaining is net mass into the hot bubble. Now, the difficulty here, of course, is the scale. This is parsecs. So the width of this front is of order 0.1 parsecs, which is difficult to resolve if you're doing galaxies. Right? And so to deal with that, we did a subgrid model. McClellan McRae actually convert the evaporation, sorry, the conduction rate into an evaporation rate, right? a mass flux. And so we did this stochastically. We have cold gas next to hot gas. And rather than gradually move mass out, we just, in a stochastic sense, said the probability of, an, of this much mass going over this time scale is such and such. We made sure that the average flow rate was the same, and we promoted entire particles at once from the, the shell into the hot bubble. So that's how we, we dealt with it. And this only occurs for material that's hotter than 10 to the 5K. So this effectively regulates the bubble temperature. It loads it up with mass, and because the... Uh, the conductivity is so strongly dependent on temperature, it only really goes until you're around a million degrees. Then it self-saturates, right? So basically, you just evaporate like crazy until you get to a million degrees or so in the bubble. So this is a high-res simulation using SPH with just that physics in, right? So we have the bubble. What we're looking at is column density. And when we first ran this, of course, we assumed that something was horribly wrong because the shell wasn't staying nice and thin. It was actually becoming thick. Um, and then we realized that's because Ethan got there first. And so that's actually a Vishniak instability, Vishniak 83. Um, so the bubble, the bubble shell is actually um, unstable and becomes finite width um, 
and these little sort of fingers start, this is an early phase, these fingers start and they grow and they protrude out and this is something that um, Krauss et al. saw um, with their Nirvana simulations of the same phenomenon. Um, it's also been explored by McLeod and Whitworth and others. So that's just with the... So the main role of magnetic field in this is to mediate the, the conductivity, right? So the electrons can't, their mean free paths get reduced, right? So it changes the effective uh, conductivity and reduces it quite a lot. Um, we found, though, that because it's so self-limiting, it doesn't have a large impact on the temperatures you get. Right? So we, we did try some experiments. We changed the conductivity parameters by two or three orders of magnitude, and the temperatures we got didn't change very much. So in terms of the mass loading we get, rather than just the ejector mass, which is given by the green line here, which we can't resolve because their star particle is the red line, we now get about this much mass coming out into the, the uh, bubble. So in, in these tests, we didn't have just one star, we had many, but we'd like to get something we can use in cosmology where we may have one particle representing an entire cluster. So that was part of our goal here. This way, a star cluster that's one particle would make six particles worth of bubble. And hopefully we're doing slightly better than that. And we were able to um, match the silage results for what the hot bubble mass should be, for example. However, we don't always have this kind of resolution, right? We will spend, you know, at least part of the time with the hot bubble mass being subparticle on scale. And if we do that and we just average everything, it's going to cool away because the average temperature will be uh, 10 to the 5K. So the way we got around that is we deal with, a temp we use a temporary two-phase particle. While the bubble's unresolved, we actually split the particle into two phases. One is the hot bubble phase, one is the, um, the dense part. We, the assumption we had to make was that the, they're in pressure equilibrium with each other, which is fairly good in, within the superbubble framework. And so these particles temporarily have two temperatures and two densities, then they're cooled separately. Right? So for a very short time, they have to be two-phase just for that first um, few Maggie years from here to here where it's unresolved. Right? The two-phase gets rid of itself because conductivity takes mass from the cold part and puts it into the hot part and destroys the cold part in relatively short order. So in a, in a few mega years, the two-phase nature goes away and we get a resolved superbubble instead. But this was necessary to be able to extend the model to, um, to lower resolution. So here's a test. Um, it's about 30,000 solar mass cluster, three different cases. Here's direct injection. This is where we don't have any subgrid model, and if we have enough resolution, it works just fine. Here's the subgrid model included, which allows us to take this to lower and lower resolution. And here's what's typically done, where you essentially just inject um, the, your supernova energy into your resolution element, whatever that happens to be. Right? Um, so this is, this is modeled on what uh, Oscar Egertz has been doing lately and is, is a very common approach now when you have sort of cosmological scale galaxies, you need some way to dump your energy and you dump it into a resolu resolution element or so. So in terms of sophistication, this one is the least sophisticated and works at high resolution. This is very low sophistication um, and sort of works at any resolution but doesn't give the right answer and this is our superbubble model that attempts to work at any resolution. Yeah. Whereas the rate of emission goes by tens to the square. Yes. So that's all taken into account on its Right. To, to the extent that it's a reasonable approximation that they're in pressure equilibrium with the two phases. Yeah. So here's, our, here's us running this um, in several different cases. So the green and the red are meant to be comparable. The green is just a straight up, sorry, the, the direct injection is just a straight up put it all in, no subgrid required. Um, and we get about 10 to the 46 grams per centimeter per square of momentum out after 30 mega years in that model. Uh, and then we did it again at lower resolution, 64 cubed, and we got a similar answer. 
supervival model gets um, similar answers to that resolution, and then we go down to one, um, one star star cluster, right? And then we're still in the ballpark, which is the thing that we like. That even if our resolution is so poor that our star cluster is one particle, we still get in the ballpark. Um, so that's the momentum. It turns out momentum is pretty robust. We've been comparing this to other recent work on feedback and people doing individual supernovas, such as Kim and Ostreicher. And the amount of momentum they get for supernovas is actually pretty similar to what we're getting here. Right. Um, where things really change is the hot gas mass. So here is the uh, simple model where you just dump it into a resolution element, and it just stays the same. Right. So when you have high resolution, it goes into this much mass. It's creeping up because this is um, stellar, stellar winds, mass loss, going into those elements. And then you, know, you, you multiply the resolution by uh, 8, and it goes into this much mass. Then you multiply the resolution by 8, and it goes into this much mass, which is off the chart. So the hot, hot mass you get is incredibly sensitive to the resolution in the typical standard model that people are using. Whereas in, in our models, it's, it's become fairly self-consistent. Um, all right, it's not, not very pretty, but it's a lot better than the highly resolution-dependent results that other people were getting. And so that's kind of uh, sort of full disclosure what, what goes on, but we think that given what's gone before, I mean, factors of... You're saying you're getting factor eight too much or whatever. Yeah, well, basically, as the resolution element gets bigger, you're putting your supernova ejector or whatever you're into... Fix this, though. We fixed it. That's what I'm asking. So the plot makes it look like you haven't. This? Yeah. It's not fixed? Well, that's what I'm trying to say. So what are the two solid lines and what are the two dashed lines? So the two solid lines are, uh, so the subgrid model, the super bubble model is the green, and without a subgrid model is the red. And if you just do it at a high resolution? So the red is very high resolution. So this is 128 cubed. Oh, okay. Fine. Right. Right, so we, we would argue these are all fairly well converged, whereas the blue thing is just varying wildly depending on resolution. Well, the blue thing at 128 should work the same way the red does. No, because it doesn't have conduction, so the mass doesn't go up. The mass doesn't change. So, yeah, what, if, if the mass is set here, it's ad hoc. It's either the resolution or some kind of input parameter. So the next thing we did was put this in isolated galaxies. We tried two based on what Yope Shea and, and uh, Claudio Della Vecchia did. And so he had a Milky Way analog, which is the one on the left, and that's showing stars. Um, this is our recruitment video. <laughs> and the one on the right is a dwarf. Um, and this one's showing gas. And uh, neither of these has a particularly high surface density, so that the burstiness you see in this one in particular is a transient effect when you just start the run-up. But it, it settles down. So, um, the, so we, get, we get on the Kendikat-Schmidt from this, um, but as I said, you look at the little dwarf guy, which is the red triangles, he's barely making it to 10 solar masses per parsec squared, so it's not a very exciting case. We don't have a two-phase medium, et cetera, that would lead to any kind of quenching of star formation below that scale. So we're essentially just matching the, the power law form of Kenny Kutchmitt. And these plots here are just showing that the two-phase state doesn't last very long, right? So it's typically of order five mega years or less, and it doesn't get more than a few hundred parsecs out of the disk in that state. Because we're trying to create winds here, we don't want weird particles floating off in air winds in, into the IGM. So we, just, we wanted to confirm that they went away. So this is the kind of temperatures we can get. So white here is 10 million degrees. So we're making very hot bubbles now, um, which essentially no one was making before. And this stuff is buoyant, and so it's able to sort of bubble out of the... Uh, our Milky Way analog without any much, uh, too much difficulty. I should point out that this is not an outflow in the sort of extreme galactic wind sense. It's more of a fountain, right? So this is a quiescent Milky Way type galaxy here. And the resolution is not wonderful. These are individual SPH particles doing their thing out there. So what we really like about this, if it will behave, is that we actually have a temperature density phase diagram that looks sane, which if you, if you bother to look at that part of galaxy formation papers, it's almost always nuts, because they almost always have a whole bunch of material living here, which is physically ridiculous, because these are curves of constant cooling time. This curve is 10 to the 4 years or less. This curve is a million years or less. 
So you really shouldn't have anything there, right? Whereas most galaxy simulations do, and it's living there because its cooling has been shut off or some other trick to allow it to live there and maintain its energy. What we have on this plot is actually every particle is represented in two locations if it's multi-phase. So it forms stars down here, and then part of it goes to live up there in the hot phase, and the other part is down here in the cold dense phase. So they're schizophrenic, and that's shown schematically here. You get cold and dense, you form stars, and then you go up to here, and then you just uh, cool adiabatically as you expand out of your disk. Right? This is one of the critical problems with a lot of feedback as done now. Right? It's not good enough to just make hot gas. Right? If you make hot gas at the ISM density, by the time it gets into your halo, it will adiabatically cool to 10,000 Kelvin or less. Right? So you need to make hot bubbles that are not just hot but also very low density. So their entropy is high enough that when they bubble their way out into the halo, they're still hot. Right? Right, so the, these things essentially getting straight up here, they've got very low densities and they've got the high temperature at the same time. Right? If you make 10 to the 7 K somehow here at this kind of um, density, then if you evolve adiabatically, you're going to be down here when you get to the halo. Right? So you're not going to be making any kind of warm, hot wind out of that. So in terms of the outflows, as I said, this is more of a quiescent case. So you start off with a bit of a transient burst where you get a few hundred kilometers per second, you know, up to maybe seven, eight hundred for a short while, but that's a transient because of the initial state, and then you settle down to sort of fountainy type bubbles with you know, sort of 50 kilometers per second type um, outflow rates. And we can compare it to our old treatment, which we call blast wave. This is from Stinson 2006, and the star formation rate is a little bit lower. But the mass loading is a lot higher. So this is a mass loading here. We have a star formation rate um, of order um, 10 solar masses per year. And then we have a, a mass loading of uh, about 1 in this case. Sure. Well, the previous part, the previous slide, this one? OK. You were remarking that uh, earlier Lots of hot and I'm not saying SPH, I'm saying everybody. Lots of hot and very dense gas, which means incredible pressures. Yes. So the pressure presumably basically high side of the limit to get into the outermost part right. of the galaxy is the wind. Yeah. So how how can you have such a or is the magnitude change in the high side of pressure? Well they do they'd launch themselves out. Right? But there's you know the pressure is sigma times surface density times G. Yeah. But if you dump a whole bunch of supernova energy, you don't have to be in pressure equilibrium. But that only has to be in an average sense. Right? I agree with you in an average sense, your pressure should equal sigma squared. But locally, it doesn't have to. No, and if you want to get stuff out of a galaxy, it can't. They're explosions. Yeah. They're way overpressured. Yeah. They're hugely overpressured. Yeah, you've got, you got to chimney your way out somehow. You've got to be overpressured, yeah. So now I want to switch gears slightly and talk about where cosmological galaxies are. So this is. The Aquila Comparison Project, which is a paper I really liked, and I was on it, so that's one reason to like it. But uh, this is Cecilia Skenepeko and Marcus Vetterpool and so on. And the idea was you start with that halo in dark matter, and you give it to everybody, and you say, simulate it. What, what do you get? Right? And um, everyone did that. And these are the groups and codes. Now, Gadget 3 was public, so many, many people ran Gadget 3. And all these gadget threes up here, the G3, 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 are all different groups. And so what's varying is some of them do different cooling. Some have primordial, some have metals, some have element by element metals. This is like the Leiden group. And uh, I think up here at the top was um, people working with Volker directly. And then lots of other groups and uh, Japanese group and so on. So they're all different. Um, at the fine scales. The hydro is the same, the end body is the same, they should be identical, but the cooling and the star formation recipes are different for those, right? And here's gasoline, it's us, and there's Ramses. This is all done by Romain Tessier, but with some slightly different assumptions about what feedback 
he included. And then there was no repo case, which was done by Volker. And this is what you get, right? Same galaxy. Um, in particular, all these ones up here are gadget galaxies. So you can get anything. It can be an elliptical, it can be a spiral, it can have different kinds of spirals. Um, a repo made a pretty good S0 kind of thing. Um, some of the Ramses had nice big disk, maybe SD-ish type thing. So the bottom line is this field is not very mature, right? If you're given the same initial halo, you would hope that if we understand what we're doing, we get similar galaxies out. Are these ones uh, impacted by the old SPH thing um, That's Ramses, that's a repo. Um, I doubt it. I thought the old SPH thing was overblown anyway. It didn't seem to change much in terms of accretion histories. It changed the internal structure, like instabilities and so on. But it does make a difference, but the bigger thing is the physics of the, well, not physics, how people implement the feedback. Yeah, so it was kind of a bit of a storm in a teacup compared to the fact that the feedback and the star formation were all so different. So the thing I'd like to focus on is stellar mass. So stellar mass varies by an order of magnitude between these groups, right? So this, this is the sort of start of abundance matching. This is Guo et al. 2010. And this is the, the band where they thought galaxies should live. And this is the evolution of the halos that were in this study. Lots of different groups. There's a Ramses up there, and there's another Ramses and another Ramses. Um, this is a, a Takashi Okamoto with gadget, and there's other various gadgets. There's a, there's a repo. A repo is a really big thing going crazy. Um, I think Galform was a semi-analytic attempt, and there's another one, a semi-analytic attempt, and where are we? Gasoline should be here somewhere. Yeah, where are the plus? We did really well, and then things went really badly near the end. <laughs> but uh, the bottom line is that no one could get it to work, and the only ones that kind of got sensible answers, they reached into their back pocket, and they pulled out the biggest honking feedback they can think of and just slammed it in and then they could, they could kind of make things work. So one way of looking at this is a colossal failure of stellar feedback. If stellar feedback is playing an important role in these massive galaxies, it wasn't doing it, right? Um, so that's one way to look at it. And so you might imagine that everyone's an independent scientist would not respond to this in the same way, but in fact, everyone did respond the same way. The way to resolve this was to blow the crap out of the, the gas in the galaxy. And so, uh, Greg Stinson got a, got, kind of got a good head start on this, and, but others have been doing this too. Um, so for example, the, the more recent Eagle simulations, they're, they're big uh, set of galaxies, they've gone to 200% supernova feedback. They just arbitrarily doubled the energy per supernova. They didn't make it metal dependent um, to, to tune a little more, so that's a couple of free parameters. Illustrious, the big Arepo-based um, galaxy suite, they use 300% supernova feedback, right? So the solution that everyone hit on was to add more free parameters and to just really crank. Well, I would say everyone, go ahead. All right, well, all right. I, I would argue that coming up with clever new ways to do feedback is similar to a free parameter. So this is why I put Phil here. I know Phil doesn't tweak his free parameters as much as others do, but his, the, the guts of his feedback models are very fancy. So I would say that that mimics a free parameter to some degree. So um, was the Hopkins, so the Hopkins code was uh, on that? Uh, no, he wasn't on the prior thing. It wasn't on no. that paper? Why is that? I don't know. He just didn't participate. Because we didn't have the feedback models working yet. Yeah, exactly. I mean, uh, I mean that, the idea was to try to understand well, different forms of feedback, well, not to tweak the supernova. The other thing is that people just sort of ran this with whatever they had, right? So people didn't right. refine anything. This was done very, uh, these comparisons are always a little bit rough. So yeah, so you're always taking a bit of a risk no, by participating. That, that Phil had been previously doing cosmological simulations using regular gadget and using the equation of state model from Hernquist. Yeah, okay. which I don't like at all, but yeah. Crap. Yeah, like exactly, that. yeah. Yeah. But it didn't happen until after that. Right. That was done. So in defense of Phil, he's taken a similar path to us, and he does get a good answer on this curve. So um, this is Greg's, uh, Greg Stinson's attempt. And so this is kind of his old approach, blast wave. And then he went into the code and turned on and off different things until he got something that, that worked fairly well. For example, 
Um, this curve here, he increased the feedback by 120%, and he changed the diffusion rates um, of thermal energy and things like that and got lots of different answers. In the end, he, uh, he put in, so the red curve here that he likes, he put in additional energy, which he pointed at radiation pressure, and he also pointed a bit at UV and things like that and said, I have extra reservoirs of energy. Um, so, but the thing is that I think one way to think about this is if you, if you take the supernovae as a normalization point, he is putting in more energy, right? He's arguing that it's a little different, but he's using it within the blast wave model, so the way it impacts the, the simulation is similar, right? So even though it's normally a different source, one way to look at it is to suggest you're normalizing your feedbacks to the supernova amount. He put in more. He got an answer he liked. So what constrains the gray area there? So this is from um, Ben Moster. Um, I don't know. So I, I think it may be variants. It's abundance matching models with the variants. With the variants, yeah. So Exactly. Yep. As estimated by Ben Moster, right? There, there is a little bit of black magic in the abundance matching. Well, there's two different ones now. Yeah. And they sort of agree. They sort of agree, but not. Else. But particularly at high ridge, if they kind of start to disagree quite a lot, right? So this early time here, right, is not necessarily such great agreement. So this is where we are right now. So this is a no feedback galaxy, just does what you might expect, goes crazy. Here's blast wave with modern SBH, which still has the same issues. So the SBH change didn't really resolve that issue. And this is where we are. Um, we, we're still at redshift, uh, you know, a half or something, uh, and counting down. So the thing that we like, though, is we don't actually have a free parameter in the model. So this is just what we get raw. If we get too high, then we think that we can use that as an argument that we need additional feedbacks that we didn't include, right? Um, so we're very happy with what's happening here, and Ben is writing this up right now. This is G1536. So we took the same one that uh, Greg used. It's around 10 to the 11 solar masses. So okay. yeah. speed of but your temperatures aren't at the escape temperature, are they? Um, yeah, mo a lot of the material is removed early, not late. Oh. You're not removing things at late times. No, nobody's removing things at late times, to my knowledge. Yeah, so the sub halos are, are blowing out gas. Yep. And then it's hanging around in the halo. Yeah, so a lot of the star formation occurring now is fueled by hot halo re accreting. Okay. Yeah. So it's just a 10 to the 11 solar mass halo? Or at the end. Dollar. At the end, 10 to the 11 solar mass halo at the end. It's still a small Yeah, it's a small guy. So yeah. this model predicts that all the variants are still there. They're just... They're in the IGM, essentially. They're so not in the halo. They're not, they're not in the halo. So wait a minute. Again, you have this bigger halo. How do you blow up the variants? You, know, you blow it out of the sub-halos before they get in. And you're saying that's because they go get to assemble and so they're there. Like yeah. 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 It's what everybody's finding, Chris. It's what everyone's, that's the answer that people like. I think it has not yet fully been matched against, you know, CGM type things, magnesium two lines, systems, so on. So, yeah, there should, it should be a way to keep everyone honest on this, right? You should get the magnesium two and other uh, absorption line system observations correct, right? If oxygen six, these kinds of things, right? So, uh, Faye here is doing that. Oh, you're doing that. Oh, good. Good that someone's doing that. <laughs> yeah. So you can, you can do that to our galaxies if you like. Um, so this is where we are now. Uh, we don't yet have redshift zero, but we're pretty happy with where it appears to be going. Just want to make a quick comment on the way things look. So um, here's a super bubble, and that's what it looks like in gas surface density. So 10 is around white, right, or just below white reddish. Um, this blast wave has much bigger holes in it. I think, unrealistically large. If you double the feedback in the blast wave, you might get a stellar content that you like, um, but you can destroy your galaxy, right, in, in maybe unrealistic ways. When we doubled the super bubble feedback, it didn't destroy the galaxy quite as badly. No feedback is just not much left at that point in terms of gas. And uh, the one on the top left is we started playing a little bit with the star formation criteria because we've tried, we tried to kind of remove parameters from the feedback part but the star formation models are, are also fairly ad hoc. Uh, and this is something Phil's done a lot of interesting work on recently as well. But I don't think he's converged. I mean, there's still kind of 
open so what the right way to do that is. The galaxies edge on because they're ugly. Oh, they are ugly. Yeah, they're really fat, like the, the, these yeah. ones. Are, yeah. So this is the big problem right now is the morphology. Yeah, yeah. the yeah. morphologies. And I think the one of the trouble with morphology, which my applied math colleagues are always telling me, is that we are not doing high Reynolds number gas. We're doing honey. So we're putting pots of honey on the stove and boiling them away. And so whereas in real gas, you should get nice chimneys like W4, W5. Here we're boiling honey and just make these big bubbles that go bloop and take half the ISM with them, right? So I think that that may be something which is very difficult to resolve in detail. So that also though applies to the super bubble models, right? Yes. They, they should be leakier than they are in the simulation. Probably, yes. Yeah, we're probably a lower limit, okay. I think. Yes. Right. So yeah, so the, the, these kind of these kind of numbers, right, yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe it should be blowing out even more. So I'd, yeah, I'm more comfortable to be high rather than low. If I was low, I'd be uncomfortable. Um, yeah, so some of the other things we tried when we doubled the supernova, we got some slightly crazy results. Those are the well, dash. Not crazy. That's perfectly sensible. Really? Let's well, see. One. Yeah, well, you put in too much energy, uh, I have too few stars. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it's sensible from a physical response perspective, but not from a ma matching what real galaxies seem to do. And when we changed their star formation criteria, such as C star, we didn't change things too much, right, in terms of uh, what we got. Um, with the super well, bowl. Yeah, and I have a, a, a bit of a plot on that. Right. So this is something I'm doing with another student, looking at regulation of star formation, something Phil has looked at with illustrious people here. And yes, we find changing C star doesn't do very much. But changing the energy input does. You know, so when you multiply if you put a ten percent efficiency or hundred percent efficiency due to the arguments Eva Strike is making, you have to balance the pressure, right? So if you want to get enough support and you, um, your pressure is the same, since your surface density is the same, if your feedback is 10% efficient, you need 10 times as much star formation to balance the pressure. So yeah, in a quiescent galaxy scenario, yes, you balance the pressure and that's what your feedback does locally on small scales. So that's, it gets back to my original statement. There's two roles of feedback. There's a the small scale regulation, balancing the pressure, all that kind of thing. But occasionally you have little holes with channels and you want to really kick stuff out. And that is primarily limited to higher mass, sorry, high redshift progenitors that are lower mass, lower escape speeds. You can really get stuff out. I don't, don't see that happening in these sort of Milky Way analogs. It's like a Claire Dobbs high resolution. No, exactly. Yeah, so we, we're exploring the regulation with this guy and the blowing stuff out of progenitors more with the cosmological uh, ones. So this is, is just a summary. So we feel that uh, we've put something out there which is appealing because it's, it gives you, it's kind of come full circle in terms of how the feedback works, but we have an argument for how T feedback is set rather than having to make it a free parameter. And when we do that, they naturally regulate feedback mass and temperature. The remaining caveat is probably the one Norm raised that if our hydro is not high enough Reynolds number, then our mass loadings are probably affected by that. And so we think we probably have a lower limit on, on the true mass loadings. Um, so yes, we are possibly resolution sensitive. If you can build a really big wind though, like a, like a big M82 kind of hourglass, then hopefully the resolution problems aren't too severe in that case. Dwarfs. Yeah, exactly, two dwarfs. Actually, Frank Shu was visiting. He said, model, do M82. Observers want you to do that. Do it. Um, and the other thing that's fun, since we have mechanical continuous energy injection now, we can try other things like AGN within the same framework, right? A lot of the other models, it's a blast wave, has a finite start time and a finite duration, not very good for continuous input, whereas we can do continuous input. So you could put AGN into this framework. It's not something we've tried yet, but it's sort of down the road, something we want to do. And that's my, that's my summary, so I'm done. I don't think, I think if we need to do things to large halos, we need to use AGN or something like that to do it. Well, with large, it's just 10 to the 12. Sorry? A large, I would claim, is not 10 to the 12, it's bigger. You sure. can go to 10 to the 13 solar mass halos? Then clearly. With, no, without adjusting the parameters yeah. that Phil has picked. Yeah. 
you actually get the right stellar mass at redshift zero in 10 to the 13 solar mass halos. Just with supernova. Just with supernova. What you oh, really? get right is that at redshift zero, there's still too much cooling gas. Right. And so you get too much star formation. Right. It's a little too blue. But you've blown the gas out and you've got the right stellar mass. You've really blown it out beyond the railroad. Yeah, it's not clear the AGN have to move a lot of mass out, but no. just keep keep the halo hot, there's essentially. Sort of maintenance. Yeah. yeah. Except at 10 to the 14 or 10 to the 15 solar mass halo. At 10 to the 14, you, even there, you don't see that many, too many stars. So you can get rid of the star formation just with. You can, get, you can get the right... You can, you can get the gas out of the galaxy, but keeping it in the ICM may need some work. So in other words, the stars really don't get far beyond the zero. No, 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 exactly, yeah. So it, it, well, they get a few times. Well, someone said IGM, so I, 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 was, I was getting... Well, all right. Beyond the variable rate, we're probably not beyond the turnaround, for example. No, yeah, I'd, I'd buy that, sure. Cycling around variable rates. Yeah, exactly. A few times. Long cooling times, just out there doing nothing. Yeah, it's, it's tricky to make claims about what form they're in. Some people claim they're in little lumps. We can't really resolve that. So, it's, yeah, that's something we just can't, Nobody can't can do. resolve that any time soon. Well, but you, you might resolve by being clever in terms of zoom-ins and looking at little toy versions of it. Doing so. You still can't resolve All right, that. I'll buy that. <laughs> you showed one movie, Head John, with the podcast blowing up the disc. Sure. And then it looked like you had sort of a thin layer of hot gas with some cold gas sandwiching it, and then the hot. Yeah, we do, we do get some entrainment, right? So the, the little guy, the little dwarf in the early blowout had, it doesn't want to play. Yeah, there's, there's some entrainment of lumps, right? But I, I don't believe we're doing that right. That's very hard to get right. So yeah, there's entrainment of lumps coming up, but what version of SPH is this? This is a modern version, equivalent to Phil's P, P, E, S, P, H. Because we didn't see it so clumpy as that. Right. Uh, what's your resolution? Um, I think this one's a few hundred solar masses per particle. And the, the sports resolution? I don't know. Because we were doing it like, you know, a few solar masses per particle. Right. And subparsec. And we didn't see it be that. It's very sensitive to, I mean, this isn't cosmological, right? So it's very sensitive yeah, to the cooling function you use. So we've been recently playing with their cooling functions and to, to get ones with a better two-phase instability. So that may have played a role. Yeah, if you have UV out there, it's going to fry these things. Yeah. We'll put in the UV because it's there. Yeah. Really yeah, this is, these were just toy tests, really. Yeah. Can you expect the supernovas and dwarf galaxies to really be the same as they melt away analog? I think so, yeah. Where it gets tricky is if you're in a starburst with very high surface densities. I'm not sure how you get the process going there. Right. So I'm not, I'm not going to make specific claims about 100 solar masses per parsec squared and up kind of stuff. Well, but you had redshift. Your galaxy that's got almost to redshift one or wherever it was. Yeah, a half or so. Yeah. So at redshift two, what was the star formation rate? It's, hmm, I think it was pretty high. Yeah, pretty high. So that's like going to have a high surface density. So you go look at that run. Yeah, yeah. Because you got the answer. Wow. I mean, the answer for your code. Yeah, for the code, yeah. So, so there's a lot of stochasticity in this, um, which I guess if one can do this cosmologically, you can sort of put in. But you probably need, of course, a brain log from the one that you no. Right. Um, at what point, let's look optimistically to the future, at what point will you be able to tell me how much control hydrogen there is in a simulated galaxy relative to reality and how much CO there will be? Go is look that at just sort of so far downstream that it's all got to be, you know, a dial parameter? Well, there's an answer. Yeah, I'm not the right answer. On the web right now, so Claude Andre, Fosher Jaguer. Claude Andre, Fosher Jaguer. You know, he's a down by Fosher. Is he Canadian? He's Canadian. Oh, okay. With a name like that, come on. I know. It's like Mark Ventron, the world champion. It's a double hyphen. He's French Canadian. Anyway, so, it's on, so we did this calculation for uh, Lemon Alpha. And, uh, you know, 
So the result we got was that we get covering factors that look exactly like what you see in observations, except for in halos that are big enough to host AGN. We underestimate the neutral hydrogen covering factor. And it's probably related to in, in big halos where the AGN is active, they, they do drive out a lot of hydrogen, but they don't make it all completely ionized. Is that with a self-shielding correction of some kind or not? In, in our simulations, yes. Okay. Because I always thought that was the tricky part, you exactly how to, to how to do that. He's yeah. Got his model yeah, his exactly. Okay, you know, believe it or not. Yeah. So, so the answer is, I think that you can certainly get predictions from calculations that currently agree reasonably well with observations, but are wrong in ways that you know are that tell you things. Now, whether you really should believe that. Okay, so maybe we can continue this over the cookies. Uh, let's thank James again.